Hello everyone, so looking forward to this week. Uh, I hope you enjoy this voice thread on reform movement. So what we're talking about this week is reform movements of the 1840s. And reform movements of the 1840s were motivated by a number of things. One of the things that it was motivated by was the Second Great Awakening. Now, you love the First Great Awakening. Uh, you're going to really love the Second Great Awakening. It was so good they made a sequel. As you recall, the First Great Awakening was a period of great religious fervor, religious uh, revivals, a lot of fire and brimstone speeches. And what was important about the First Great Awakening was that it was a uniquely American experience. It was a type of revolution before the American Revolution. In some ways, America had rebelled already from uh, a traditional uh, authority, the, the church, uh, prior to its rebelling against uh, the British government. The Second Great Awakening is the same idea. It's, it's this period filled with great religious fervor, um, but the outcome is different. It encourages a tremendous amount of reform movements. People are trying to be better people. Uh, they're trying to do God's work. And we see that in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, this image is a great image. This is a, one of these revivals. And you can see, you know, here's the minister preaching, and you can really see the hands are in the air, and the women are, you know, I don't know what they're doing, but they, they seem like they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can see all these people around. If you look in the back, you can even see little tents, and, and maybe you see them over here even better. And this refers to something that's sometimes called the Burnt Over District, or the Burned Over District. Upstate New York, there were so many of these revivals, and there was no Howard Johnsons or uh, Days Inns to go to, so people would just pack up tents and, and have a campfire. So there were so many campfires burning, it was said that it was burned over. Um, that's how many revivals there were. That's how into religion people were. Um, we see a, the advent of a lot of different religious groups. The Mormons um, emerged during this time period. The Baptists and the Method, Methodists had been around, but they explode. They take a lot of uh, new converts into the religion. We see people like William Miller who were professing that it was the end of the world. Uh, today, the Seventh-day Adventists uh, are, are uh, forerunners of, of that movement. Um, it was a period of great religious fervor. That religious fervor is going to lead to the desire to get involved in reform movements. <clears throat> so, what reform movements do they get involved in? One of the most important reform movements during this time period is temperance. Temperance is a reform movement that attempted to abolish alcohol. And an interesting aspect of the temperance movement and many of these reform movements is that they were often led by women, especially upper middle class women who perhaps had a college education, had skills, had talents, uh, but weren't allowed to go into the workforce, weren't allowed to be professionals. We're looking for some way to exercise their creativity and their intelligence uh, in, in an acceptable way. Many, many women got involved in reform movements. And what type of reform movements are women going to get involved in? They're interested in the family. They're interested in, in protecting their children. Uh, and a major problem at this time was alcohol. So a couple of great images down here. This one is from an old AP exam. And it's just a powerful image, I think. It, it starts with from first sip, you know, to last. And here the guy is, he's taking his first sip, and things are okay, and here he is, you know, out with the girl, uh, etc. Eventually on top of the world, all the while, you know, his wife and child are, are here crying at home alone. And then, of course, you know, the sad descent, and eventually he shoots himself. You can see the gun uh, in his hand. Um, here's another picture of, of these two guys with the stereotypical red noses coming out of the saloon, and it says, no wonder the wives of these men have joined the praying band. So religion and morality and alcohol and whether or not government should get involved in it, uh, the banning of alcohol, were all connected during this time period, and it speaks to that second great awakening that we talked about earlier. There were, uh, most people come into class knowing about prohibition in the 1920s, 
But what a lot of people don't know is that alcohol was uh, illegal in many states. You know, the earliest state to make alcohol illegal was Maine in 1851. Uh, Neil Dow, from the famous Dow Jones, uh, took his fortune and, like a lot of these wealthy men, uh, was dedicated to trying to do a social good in the world. And, and what he was interested in was the issue of temperance and abolishing alcohol. Um, you still see this uh, in certain places. In New Jersey, there are certain counties that don't sell alcohol on Sunday. Maine, the same thing. So it's kind of interesting to see kind of the, the effects of this uh, over 100 years later. Again, uh, women playing an important role in the reform movement, Dorothea Dix and the treatment of the mentally ill. Um, she's a remarkable woman. And when you talk about the 1840s and you talk about how people with mental illness were treated, um, I found this, this image uh, that I think depicts how mentally ill were treated because this guy tied to a chair. It's called the Tranquilizing Charities for the Treatment of Mentally Ill. Uh, really what she did, at, like a lone crusader, she went around with her clipboard and went to these asylums to see how uh, mentally ill were being treated. She was horrified by their treatment and, and documented horrific stories. Uh, when, you, when you read about Dorothea Dix and the things that she wrote about, um, it really will just you know, turn your stomach uh, People locked in cages, uh, no place to go to the bathroom, or a woman pulling out her own flesh, uh, you know, and, and then doing nothing about it, treating them like animals. In certain places, uh, wealthy people would take tours of the asylums to go see the crazy people and see what they look like, almost like a, like a zoo. Uh, the stories were horrific. And like I said, Dorothea Dix, a woman crusader, uh, went around, documented all of this, and went, then went to state assemblies and, and, and lobbied for the creation of uh, mental hospitals, you know, scores of which today uh, bear her name. Again, she's a woman. Uh, it's, a, it's a recurring theme in these 1840 reform movements, uh, trying to better the world, uh, social reform. So another type of reform movement is prison reform. And New York State, as the home of the burned over district, there's a lot of this religious fervor in New York State. You also see a lot of these reform movements in New York State, and that's true of prison reform as well. The Auburn system uh, refers to a, a very progressive treatment of prisoners in New York. And I just, there's something about this picture that I just, uh, Love. I mean, I, I just, such a cliche, they're in their striped suits, there's this big guy here with with the big stick, and it, at first look you might say, boy, I don't know about prison reform, it doesn't seem like they're treated all that well. But this is the 1840s, and prior to this, you know, physical punishment was very common, uh, exceedingly common, and the idea in the 1840s, and specifically the Auburn system, was to have these men uh, go to prison for quiet reflection, uh, prayer, meditation. Uh, the idea that they could be saved, think about that in terms of the second great awakening, that we're not going to execute them, we're not going to have corporal punishment. These people can be saved. That's very uh, much connected to the religious fervor of the time, uh, very much connected to the idea of religion in general. That, that these people can be saved. In. But don't be mistaken, these prisons, as this picture I think testifies, were tough places. And a big part of it was that they felt like they were saving their soul and they wanted these men to meditate and pray and reflect on their sins and hopefully uh, get redemption, not only from the state, but from God. Another good example of religion playing an important role Okay, another reform movement. Now, the face of education reform happens to be that of a man, Horace, Horace Mann. Uh, Horace Mann is the name that's associated with education reform in the 1840s, but certainly was supported by a lot of women. And it goes to that same idea that 
what are women going to gravitate towards? They're going to gravitate towards reform movements that focus on the family, their children, uh, education, temperance, etc. But as I said before, uh, the person most associated with education reform is this guy right here, Horace Mann. Horace Mann was the assistant superintendent of schools for Massachusetts, and schools were really not regulated. Uh, there, there was no standard curriculum. Uh, oftentimes, teachers weren't trained well. Uh, brutality uh, by teachers against students was very common. And he believed, and this is so pertinent to today, there's so much discussion about educational reform and standards to that. He believed that there should be standards, that there should be high teacher training, there should be a, you know, accurate teacher training, high quality teacher training, uh, and that there should be free public education. And the idea that in a democratic society, citizens need to be educated in order for the government to be effective was very much a motivating factor for this education reform. Um, so Horace Mann, you know, we, we prepare for regents exams, AP exams, and uh, you can blame Horace Mann. An interesting irony is in, in our area, there's a very well-known uh, private school that's named after Horace Mann, and I always joke, you know, that that's so ironic because Horace Mann was really the champion of quality free public education. On a connected note, there's this McGuffey reader that is still in use today, uh, interestingly enough. And the McGuffey reader was so widely used that it really served as a common curriculum that since so many schools across the country were using it, it served to create uh, standards that all those schools could follow. Interestingly enough, the McGuffey reader focused a tremendous amount on morality, which again speaks to that second grade. So another, edu uh, another reform movement, education. Another reform movement. Well, women play an important role along with these reform movements. And we have education and mentally ill and temperance, prison reform. And of course, what reform movement are women going to be you know, uh, selfishly interested in? That's women's right to vote, women's suffrage. Uh, the women's suffrage movement really gets its start in, in 1848 at Seneca Falls, where Seneca Falls, upstate New York, again, the burned over district, where that religious fervor is at the height, is the same place where we see reform movements uh, most active. So Seneca Falls was a women's right convention where women demanded the right to vote. They produced a document called the Declaration of Sentiments. The Declaration of Sentiments is modeled after the Declaration of Independence, almost word for word. Um, it follows it, including women, obviously, making the point that in 1776, America fought for their rights, and in 1848, women are fighting for their rights. Uh, it will be a long time for women to get the right to vote. Uh, if it was so easy, you know, it's going to be a good 70 years till women get the right to vote. But in 1848, they begin that journey. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stan is an important player at Seneca Falls. My personal favorite uh, is Sojourner Truth. And she's just, uh, has an amazing personal story. She was a former slave. Sometimes Sojourner Truth will be on a test, and because she's a former slave, uh, sometimes kids will misunderstand where she's coming from. She was active in the abolitionist movement as well. Uh, I think she's best known in terms of the women's rights movement, women's suffrage specifically. And I had this great little image here of Sojourner Truth with her most famous speech. Um, I'm going to read it to you. I, I'm pretty sure you can probably read it on your own, but just in case. The gist of it was she was giving a speech. Uh, the story goes that this, her most famous speech, is completely ad lit that she just said it off the top of her head. She's giving a speech, and as you can imagine, there's some guys in the back, you know, heckling her, giving her a hard time. So she stops the speech and says this. The man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into carriages or puddles or gave me the best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at my arm. I've plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could heed me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have 
born thirteen children, and seen most of them sold into slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me.